In selecting Ambassador Ron Dermer, Israel's ambassador to the United States, as the inaugural recipient of the ACM Distinguished Leadership Award, we honor with pride our own American-born Jewish Israeli leader who has brought his own dreams and his own vision to the reality of contributing his best and the best of his family to the future of the Jewish people, the future of the State of Israel, and the principles of Zionism to which he is committed on his behalf and on behalf of all of us. To present our keynote address today, we invite Ambassador Dermer to the podium. And in doing so, we're honored to present to you, Mr. Ambassador, if you'll please come forward. From Jerusalem, which we thought would be an appropriate place to purchase this special award for you. And from Israel Coins and Metals Corporation, the Holy Land Mint, we present the American Zionist Movement Distinguished Leadership Award to His Excellency Ron Dermer. This award is a sterling silver coin of Theodore Herzl, minted specially in the State of Israel. Mr. Ambassador, we're honored to present this to you today. Thank you. Thank the American Zionist Movement for this honor. Beautiful coin. Uh, I hold this honor uh, in such high regard uh, because I hold the president of this organization in such high regard. Whether he is, can wait with applause one second. It's going to get better. <laughs> Whether he is standing up for Jewish and Israeli victims of terror and holding the perpetrators of terror to account. But he's writing a book about Israel's fundamental right of self-defense, or whether he's championing Zionism in a thousand different ways. Richard Heidemann is one of the great Zionists in the world today. But as I said last night, for those of you who were there, I'm not even sure he can claim to be the biggest Zionist in his family. <laughs> there is, of course, Phyllis, who I see in the back of the room, who, as you all know, is the international chairwoman of the March of the Living, and Ilana here, who seems to have distilled the passion of both her parents, Holocaust and Zionism, into one, and Ariana and the other children who are following in the footsteps of, of their parents, and I've learned that that's usually the most important test of how deep those values go, whether the children actually carry them on. Through their philanthropy and leadership, the Heidemans are a real treasure, and their engagement and commitment to both remembering the Jewish past and securing the Jewish future is something for which we should all be deeply grateful. So please join me in thanking them for their commitment to the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Now, Richard, you picked a good year to host this conference on Zionism, this inaugural Award, and I can't think of a year richer in meaning for Zionism. This year we are celebrating 120 years since Herzl convened the first World Zionist Congress. Herzl was certainly not the first Zionist. He was not the first to think or write about a Jewish state. But he was definitely the man with the plan. He recognized that to establish a Jewish state, 
It was not enough to buy land or settle land. And this I had a disagreement with one of the speakers before about what Mitch Herzl's greatness and his understanding was. He understood it was not enough to buy land or to settle land. The Jews had to have a collective right, a national right, to settle the land. In other words, he understood that the Jews had to have the rights of a sovereign power. They couldn't just turn and lift the Bible and say, this is our right. They had to have the right of a sovereign power. Herzl also understood that the only ones who could grant that right were the great powers of the day. So despite considerable opposition, and sometimes even downright ridicule, ridicule, Herzl took out his top hat and tails and set about convincing those powers of the benefits of Zionism to them. He met with the German Kaiser, he negotiated with the Ottomans, and he deeply influenced the leaders of Great Britain. Most people don't know that when Herzl proposed the Uganda plan, the man who offered it was none other than Lord Balfour, who was the Prime Minister of Britain at the time. And the man who drafted the charter for the Uganda plan was David Lloyd George, who would be the Prime Minister when his Foreign Minister, Lord Balfour, issued that declaration. So it's obvious that though he died at 44, Herzl's Zionist labors continued to bear fruit long after his death. In fact, they bear fruit today because he did more than merely talk and write. He established an institution like the World Zionist Congress, and he laid the groundwork for what would later become the Jewish Agency, the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, and so many other organizations that have made an indelible contribution to Zionism. This year, in fact this month as you can see, we also celebrate a hundred years since the Balfour Declaration. Now Balfour did not create Zionism. Balfour did not create a Jewish state. That honor goes to statesmen like Herzl, and Jabotinsky, and Ben-Gurion. It goes to soldiers who gave their lives to create and defend that state. And it goes to the tens of thousands of immigrants who settled the land of Israel over many decades. But Balfour did galvanize Zionism and catapulted the Jewish people towards a sovereign future. Balfour was the tailwind, more like a hurricane, in fact, that propelled the ship of Zionism to statehood. While Britain was first to support the establishment of a Jewish national home, it was definitely not alone. Nearly all the great powers at the time supported it. And the members of the League of Nations gave the British a mandate to carry out the promise of that declaration. As Herzl foresaw, the recognition of a great power would prove critical. Because when the violent resistance to Zionism came, and Herzl foresaw and predicted that it would come, Balfour gave the Jewish people an anchor in the storm, a national right that was anchored in international law. In a couple of weeks, we're also going to mark the 70th anniversary of the UN partition resolution. It's a moment that Israel rightly celebrates and remembers, Kaftet in November. A moment when the nations of the world supported a plan to establish a Jewish state. But it is also a moment that Israel's enemies want to forget. Because frankly, it exposes the truth about our conflict with the Palestinians. Because when that resolution was passed, there were no Palestinian refugees. They surfaced during the War of Independence. When that UN resolution was passed, 
There were no settlements over the so-called post-67 settlements over the so-called Green Line. There was no Green Line. All these things that are supposedly the reason why we have a conflict with the Palestinians weren't there. What existed was a simple proposition. An international proposal calling for two states, for two peoples, a Jewish state and an Arab state. A proposal that was accepted by the Jews and rejected by the Arabs. And even the New York Times can't erase that history, although occasionally they try on their op-ed page. The rejection of that proposal has always been what this conflict is about. It has never been about the Jews accepting an Arab or Palestinian state. It has always been about the Palestinians accepting a Jewish state. And so it remains today. Until the Palestinians accept the legitimacy and permanence of a Jewish state, no peace plan, no envoy will succeed in achieving peace. But if they accept a Jewish state, peace will be achieved much faster than people can even imagine. The good news is that some in the Arab world are prepared to accept it. Let's hope they lead the way towards Palestinian acceptance and that the Palestinians do not waste another century trying to destroy the Jewish state, but work with Israel to try to secure a better future for all. Next May, Israel will also celebrate its 70th year of independence. We will remember the faithful decision of Ben-Gurion and courageous decision of Ben-Gurion, who faced massive pressure, including from Secretary of State Marshall. Massive pressure not to declare statehood. And Americans in Israel will rightly recall that it took President Truman all of 11 minutes to recognize Israel. But we should also recall today, as we celebrate Zionism, the arms embargo that was placed on Israel by the American government during our War of Independence. We should recall that Israel fought its War of Independence with Czech rifles. And we fought the Six Day War with French planes. Not because the Czechs made better rifles or the French made better planes. Because America wouldn't sell us those rifles and planes. We should remember that. But we should also be grateful for the remarkable transformation of Israel's relationship with the United States over these 70 years. What started out in Israel's first two decades as a moral commitment of many Americans to the Jewish state evolved into a strategic partnership in the last two decades of the Cold War and is today one of the most important strategic alliances that America has in the world. Everyone understands and should, understands, should understand what America means to Israel. They are the superpower. Everyone can appreciate the generous military assistance, the strong economic support and partnership that has been there in critical times for, to help Israel's economy, and of course the critical diplomatic support that has almost always been provided Israel. But as we celebrate 70 years of Israel's independence, we should also recognize what Israel means to America, what it means to have a powerful, reliable, democratic ally in the heart of the Middle East. You heard some of the congressmen speak about that earlier. I said last week, or a couple weeks ago, that I believe Israel is going to be the most important ally of the United States in the 21st century. But I didn't say it the first time two weeks ago. I said it three years ago in the first speech I gave on Israel's Independence Day as ambassador. And I said it at a time when we had big disagreements with the American government over Iraq, big disagreements over how to advance peace, and people looked at me like, how, how could you possibly say something like that? Because people can't see the fundamentals. They get lost all the time in the sound and fury of what's happening at the top. But the fundamentals 
are making it that Israel will be the most important ally because the biggest threats facing America for the foreseeable future, there are some exceptions like North Korea, which has popped up right now, but the biggest dangers facing America in the foreseeable future are going to emanate from the Middle East. And to the extent that the United States doesn't want to be there on the ground, they need an ally on the ground that shares their values, that shares their interests, and that can project power. And they can defend those interests and values. And they have that in the state of Israel. Not just in IDF, which is a formidable force, but in one of the best intelligence services in the world that has provided information that has prevented some two dozen terror attacks just in recent years alone. And they also can look at Israel and they can see this great source of technology. Two great centers of innovation in the world. One of them is out west, Congressman Royce's state in California. The other is east in Israel. We are a global technological power. It's hard for people to, to believe that. I think it's just something we tell ourselves. But it's true. In agriculture, in water, in cyber, now in autonomous vehicles, and in many other fields, we're a global technological power. And to the extent that America wants to look around the world and say, who can help me with our, my security, the security of my citizens, who can make them safer, and who can make my economy more prosperous? Who is going to, in this 21st century of innovation, where the ability to create conceptual products is what's driving growth, who's going to be my best partner around the world? And that best partner, uh, is Israel. And I think you're going to see this alliance get stronger and stronger and stronger. Everyone will focus on this or that issue or this or that disagreement, but the fundamentals are pushing Israel and America together and to greater and greater heights. And finally, this year we are celebrating 50 years of the reunification of Jerusalem. If I have to explain to anyone here what Jerusalem means to the Jewish people, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> It is the center of our national and religious life, but no less important. It has been the focus of our hopes and dreams for thousands of years. Hopes that we carry with us under our chuppahs, in our houses of mourning, and hopes that our nation carry with it as we face every evil under the sun, and yet we still declare the Shana Haba'ah Yerushalayim. So in this historic year of Zionist anniversaries, at this event, the American Zionist Movement, I thought I'd spend just a few minutes <coughs> reminding people what the meaning of Zionism is. And by meaning, I'm not talking about the definition of Zionism. That's very clear to me. It's the right of the Jewish people to self-determination of the land of Israel. That's what Zionism is to me. I'm talking about what it means to have a Jewish state. I'm talking about the difference between having a Jewish state and a Jewish community. I'm talking about what it means for the Jewish people to be a sovereign people again. That word, what does it mean to be a sovereign people? Does it mean saluting the flag? singing a national anthem, minting a coin, which by the way, those of you who don't know, that's why we have coins on Hanukkah, which we're going to celebrate next month, because it's a symbol of sovereignty, and the Maccabees restored sovereignty. Second time it happened for the Jewish people. The first was obviously in the days of Joshua. Second time, the Maccabees, and that's why we all have that Hanukkah guilt, those coins. Well, is that what sovereignty is about? It's certainly part of it, but they are not, uh, Baroness, as Churchill would say, the heart of the matter. That's not what sovereignty is about. The heart of the matter, at least for me, is three things. And I have tried as ambassador these last two years occasionally when I get the chance to remind people of what sovereignty means. We don't have to focus every day on what's happening in Iran and what's happening with the peace process to remind people of the blessings of sovereignty for the Jewish people. And there are three blessings that for me stand out. The first, I think, is the most obvious 
to anyone who's been paying attention about Jewish history, and that is the blessing of a shield, a shield and a sword. For centuries, we were a powerless and defenseless people. I mentioned last night, Israel didn't stop the hatred towards the Jewish people. It just gave us the power to fight back. But we did not have that power for centuries. And we had to beg a local policeman or a magistrate to protect us from a pogrom, from a massacre, from a riot. And then we had to beg kings and presidents to come to our aid, to save our community, to bomb the tracks. Today, the Jewish people beg no more. Today, the Jewish people have the ability to defend themselves. And we make secretaries around us. And we do so, and our soldiers do, with the courage of the Maccabees of old. And that power to defend ourselves is getting stronger. And Israel's military is getting stronger. Our offensive capabilities are getting stronger, thanks in large part to the support of the United States. We had our two joint strike fighters that landed last year in Israel, and Israel's the first country outside the United States that has fifth generation aircraft, thanks to the support of the United States. And we have also the unbelievable missile defense programs that are joint programs with the United States, the Aero System, David Slane, Iron Dome, and all those programs, and we are grateful, yes, Israel is grateful, that last year, President Obama signed a new 10-year MOU with Israel to provide military, military assistance for Israel for the next decade. That's the first blessing, the shield and the sword. The shield's getting bigger, the sword is sharper. The second blessing, which should be obvious, but sometimes is, is the blessing of Israel as a refuge. Because the question that preoccupied Jews for most of our history in exile was that question, where are we going to go? Or where are we going to go when inevitably the blank hits the fan? Where are we going to go when we're uprooted just like all those other communities and all those places around the world were uprooted? Where are we going to go? And today you see the rising tide of anti-Semitism around the world, and people have a lot of questions. A lot of questions about it. One question they don't have is where are Jews going to go? And the reason why they don't have that question is because Israel is an answer. It may not be the answer, and every government should do everything it can to protect its Jewish community and its Jewish citizens. But Israel is an answer. And it has been an answer for Jewish communities around the world. First, those Jews who came from the killing fields of Europe. Those Jews who were forced to flee Middle East and North Africa in the wake of Israel's creation. There were the Jews who were airlifted from Ethiopia to freedom in Israel. And there was, of course, almost a million Jews who came from the former Soviet Union when the Iron Curtain fell. We have been that refuge in there. In my, in my mind, there's no more important law in the state of Israel than the law of return. It is the defining law. It is the, the raison d'etre of Israel to be the homeland for every single Jew around the world. And that will never, ever change. Then there is the le least obvious blessing, but it's the one that's most important for me to say here, especially being at this capital of this great nation. That is the blessing that the Jewish people have a voice. The Jewish people have a sovereign voice. Without a state, we would have to ask others to plead our case. Century after century, we would send someone to beseech that king or prime minister or president, maybe that mayor or the constable, to make a case, to make the appeal for whatever the interests of the Jewish community were. Most famous of them was Jan Karski, famous 
Polish member of the resistance, who the Jews pleaded with to go to Washington and to tell somebody in the Roosevelt administration what was happening to the Jews of Europe. We begged him to do it. If you've ever seen the video of him literally with tears, crying with a task that was given to him, the Jewish people had no voice. Israel restored to the Jewish people a voice among the nations. And the PM, the Prime Minister of Israel, uses that voice. He uses that voice when he speaks at the United Nations. He uses that voice when he has meetings with presidents and prime ministers. And ambassadors have the privilege to use that voice when they get to speak to members of Congress or Parliament, or when they get to sit in a studio, CNN or the BBC. The most remarkable thing about being Israel's ambassador is that there are Israeli ambassadors. Some Jews don't recognize this transformation. They don't. At least once a week, someone will come to me and will say to me, you'll appreciate this congressman, but someone will say to me, you know, I know a guy who knows the senator. Maybe I can get you guys together. And I will say, if I want to speak to the senator or the congressman, I'll pick up the phone. It's not because of me, nothing to do with me personally. It's because I am the ambassador of Israel. We have a voice. And something else that is not fully understood yet is that along with this right to speak comes a duty to speak. And that duty is greatest when the stakes are the highest. And that was lost on many, many people during the debate some two and a half years ago of whether the Prime Minister of Israel should have come to speak in Congress here against the Iran deal. Many saw the Prime Minister's speech and my actions through a partisan lens. You heard today the importance of bipartisanship. I couldn't agree more. It's critical for Israel because you can't fly a plane with one wing. You should always have strong bipartisan support. But that had nothing to do with the decision to come and speak in Congress. Nothing could have been further partisanship from my mind. And nothing could have been further from the mind of the Prime Minister. The problem is that many people judged the Prime Minister's action based on how they saw the deal, not on how he saw the deal, or how I saw the deal, and how we still see it as a threat to the very survival of the Jewish state. All of these restrictions that that deal puts in place will be automatically removed in a few years. And Iran will not have to sneak in or break into the nuclear club. They will simply walk into the nuclear club. And we are deeply grateful that President Trump has changed the policy towards the nuclear deal with Iran from one of containment containing a nuclear-armed Iran and maybe pushing it off for a few years to prevention, and from one of accommodating <coughs> an Iran's aggression in the region to one of rolling it back. Now, there's a lot of challenges of implementing that, but the policy is set right, and Israel is deeply grateful for that. But if you want to really understand the reason why the Prime Minister came to speak here, to understand the meaning of Zionism, for him, for me, <coughs> for that you have to understand what it means for the Jewish people to not have a voice. And the best way I can explain it to you is to talk about something that happened in 1938. 1938 there was a conference in Evian, France. <coughs> Roosevelt was pressured to do this conference because there was a problem of the Jewish refugees in Europe. And they convened this conference and delegates came from around the world. 
Hitler wrote a letter to those who were at that conference. You can look it up. He said, you can have the Jews. I'll even put them on luxury ships. Well, almost no one took the Jews. The British did a kinder transport of about 10,000, and the Dominican Republic took a, a very large number of Jews for the size of its country, and we would always be deeply grateful for that. But no one else took the Jews. What's interesting to me is that there was a delegate from mandatory Palestine who was there. She was there as an observer, but she was not given the right to speak. That delegate's name is Golda Meir. So on the eve of the destruction of European Jewry, a future Prime Minister of Israel was not allowed to speak. So for me there was no question whatsoever that faced with a regime that calls for Israel's annihilation and works for Israel's annihilation every single day, that the current Prime Minister of Israel was going to speak. I said, I was at the White House a couple hours after President Trump gave his speech a few weeks ago in Iran. And I said, because of that policy being so important, for Israel's future, I said it was my second best day as Israel's ambassador to the United States. So of course the question comes, what was your best day? Well, it was the day the Prime Minister gave that speech. Because on that day, he fulfilled his most sacred duty as a Prime Minister to not be silent and to speak up. That is the meaning of Zionism. That is the meaning of sovereignty. And the fact that I could help in any way was my proudest day as Israel's ambassador. So 120 years after Herzl, 100 years after Balfour, 70 years after the UN partition, 70 years almost, of our Declaration of Independence, 50 years after the reunification of Jerusalem. I hope that the people here can be grateful for Zionism. We will have many days to focus on all those other great challenges, stopping Iran's path to a bomb and rolling back their regional aggression, moving ahead with a responsible peace process that protects our security, dealing with the problem of anti-Semitism, and BDS, and also ensuring that Israel always be a place where every Jew can feel at home. But every few decades, maybe once a century, we should stop and smell the roses and be grateful for the miracle of Zionism and the miracle of Israel. And we should remember that our grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents, going back a hundred generations, would have given anything to trade their problems with ours. 100 generations of Jews dreamed, dreamed about the possibility of living at a time when there would be a sovereign Jewish state. Three generations represented here, I see, have had the privilege of living that dream. And with that privilege comes a great responsibility, and that's to secure that dream for future generations. And under Richard's leadership, I have no doubt that the American Zionist movement takes that responsibility very, very seriously. And I have no doubt that you will all do everything you can to help secure the Jewish future. Thank you.